This is an important basic question. Does progression always occur on Tugriso? Is it possible that it stops cancer? So that's such an important and great question. You know, I think the truth is that we expect that at some point, cancers will progress on, on osimertinib. However, I will say that when that occurs is so hugely variable. And I think that the time that, you know, to development of progression can can vary so much that there are patients that I've had in my clinic who've been on Tegriso for years and may be on Tegriso for years. And I think what's really hard, and, and we saw this with older generations of EGFR inhibitors as well. And what's hard there is that, you know, we know that there's always this risk that we suspect that at some point and you know even after a long time on a targeted therapy when things have been going great we expect that eventually the cancer may figure out its way around it but there are patients whose disease remains controlled for such a long time that you know we hope that they will continue to be on that treatment and i think often the longer you've been on a treatment the the better the chances that it will continue to work for a, a long period of time it's a, it's a hard question, and I know for the patients who are asking, we always have this hope that this is going to be a drug that controls the cancer forever. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's always something that we hope for. And at the same time, I think it's important to keep an eye out because we know that even after a long time, it can develop. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard someone ask this question. Um, it was a formative experience on my pathway to becoming a thoracic oncologist because that I will confess uh, again amongst uh, you and a few of our friends that it was not my first oncologic love. Um, as a resident, I thought I was going to be a melanoma doctor because I was so intrigued by uh, immunotherapy at the time, uh, long before it was cool, because if it was cool, I wouldn't do it. Um, but I remember uh, I was a, a, a resident across town from you, and I remember Tom Lynch coming across uh, to BI and giving, uh, giving grand rounds on EGFR, and he was asked that question back when targeted therapy was so new, why doesn't it cure people? Um, and I think that we've been, uh, that question has captured uh, the attention of scientists and clinician scientists since, um, since the beginning. Um, and while there are a lot of um, speculative answers, um, we don't really have a solution for that. The sad truth is that resistance is inevitable in the overwhelming majority of patients. Um, but uh, the optimistic counter note, um, as you've noted, is that we have patients who live extraordinary amounts of time with high quality of life and creative maneuvers, right? So you do your osimertinib, you do your osimertinib past progression, you use a little stereotactic radiosurgery, you switch to a chemo regimen when you when um, after that maybe you come back to osimertinib and uh, by the time you've done that whatever resistance changed has become actionable on a trial and you know as you string these things together it's not just that you're keeping the person alive in that moment although that matters of course but also that the science advances. And so, you know, if when I see a newly diagnosed EGFR mutated uh, patient and the question is, well, how long uh, on average do you expect me to live? I don't know. And I have no clue for a very happy reason. I don't know just how insanely fast the science is going to advance and what creative maneuvers are going to work. But I will say that at least in my own head, my optimism is far greater than probably any other class of patient that um, with all of these maneuvers, um, that the chance of uh, long, uh, long survival is quite real. I think that's such an important point and, and maybe such a hopeful note, I think, you know, to, to have at the end of this session is that, you know, really this, this is so true. If we look at the pace with which osimertinib went from phase one trials, which started, you know, 2011, 2012, to first FDA approval in the second line setting after T790M in 2015, to studies looking at it in the frontline setting, to, you know, that being positive and to approval for, for frontline use in 2018, it's unprecedented. And if we look at the number of different drugs that have been improved for lung cancer even this year, we are seeing that pace, I think, you you know, becoming faster and faster for really great reasons. And, and I, I, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that we'll continue to see that and that we will have better treatments for patients, you know, after who've already had osimertinib. And, and I think, as you say, that we will be able to, to come up with new ways to keep cancers in check on various treatments for a long, long time to come. So um, this has been really uh, a great pleasure uh, to, to present together with you and to chat with you. Um, I want to briefly summarize for our audience and feel free to interrupt or, or add, but um, I think we've had an evolving uh, standard in frontline that's really led us to osimertinib um, as the uh, clear winner. Um, we have numerous challenger strategies of adding to it with um, VEGF uh, and VEGF receptor agents, bevacizumab and remucirumab, or uh, with chemotherapy. At the time of resistance, we have 
Uh, many strategies and the right one to pursue is heavily dependent on uh, the exact situation, a patient's physiologic strengths and weaknesses, and of course, critically values. But they certainly include uh, in our general arsenal treatment past progression, um, stereotactic radiosurgery um, uh, as hamburger helper, if you will, uh, to keep our uh, treatment working a little bit longer, uh, switch to chemo with some debate about which regimen, um, continuation of drug with chemo, returning to drug at some point uh, later past progression, and that for our uh, molecularly targeted uh, effects, um, we have a variety of uh, resistance changes that emerge, great heterogeneity, and an emerging literature to lead us to believe that many of these uh, are in fact actionable um, and will become increasingly actionable. I think that's a great summary. And you know, what I will add is that there's a lot of clinical trials in this space, you know, many, many ongoing around the country and around the world. And I'm sure many people on, you know, on the line have already participated in those. And we are so incredibly grateful to them for, you know, contributing to those efforts and for, for, you know, working with us on these clinical trials. And I also encourage everyone to ask their doctors and, you know, to, to look into whether clinical trials may be an option for them, because sometimes it can be a great way to access new treatments. That being said, for some patients, it's, you know, not the right thing for various reasons. And that's okay, too. There are lots of standard of care options that I think can be very effective. So I think, you know, hopefully we can end on a message of real hope and optimism for the future. And, and I know there's a lot of worry, too, in COVID and the pandemic about whether we're still doing research and, and, you know, whether we're still trying to advance the field. And I think it's also important to say that absolutely we, we, you know, we are seeing patients with these types of lung cancers every day. And we know that this is just so incredibly important and, and that, you know, new treatment strategies are needed and, and we will continue to work to develop them.